Good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. I'm Stacey. I'm sure I know quite a few of your familiar faces. I'm part of the GFIT team. Um, this talk is actually as part of our Optimize for Watch initiative. It's a global initiative that aims to provide Googlers with an education programs to help their families get more get healthy. Um, to see all our upcoming uh, Health at Google speaker series and topics, we visit GoTo a while. And you can please take about 30 seconds at the end of the talk to provide your feedback and uh, a go slash healthy at survey. So, a little bit of introduction on why we're here today. Time Magazine, Time Magazine has named Tandem as one of the top 100 most influential people in the world, and Men's Health Magazine has hailed him the fittest man on the planet. An internationally recognized endurance athlete and best-selling author, Dean Karnasich, has pushed his body and mind to inconceivable limits. Among his many accomplishments, he has run 300 con continuous miles, We're going sleep for three days, he has run across Death Valley at 120 degree heat. We all know what that's like here in Mount Hood, right? He has run a marathon to the South Pole at negative 40 degrees. So we have actually know what that's like. California. Not really. On 10 different occasions, he's run 200 mile relay. Um, so he's run this relay race solo, racing alongside teams of 12. I think some of us know this race, this relay race. His longest list of competitive achievements include winning the world's toughest foot race, the Bad Winter Ultra Marathon, running 135 miles nonstop across Death Valley during the middle of summer. His most recent endeavor is running 50 marathons in all 50 states in 50 consecutive days. Finishing with, with a New York marathon with, his, with, um, with running in three hours flat. Always wanting to do more and give more to help others in need, Dean Karnassus has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for charity through his running and sports career. He has participated in the Leukemia Society of America's team and training and the Man of the Year programs. He has raised money for Special Olympics and has selflessly contributed his time and energy to numerous youth fitness programs, environmental causes. For his, for his tireless efforts, Dean has, was awarded the prestigious Community Leadership Award by the President's Council of Physical Fitness and, and Sports. So with that, I'd like to hand it over and introduce Dean Karnassus. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for that very uh, gracious introduction. I will just say I am, I am not worthy, believe me. Um, I heard her um, talking about this guy who ran 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days, and I thought she was going to say, he's dead, but uh, <laughs> we got a good stand-in for him. But it's great to be back at Google. I was here a few years ago and gave a similar talk. And I've got a lot of friends who work at Google. And obviously, there's a lot of really uh, gifted um, athletes and runners that work here as well. Uh, in fact, uh, you guys have a uh, probably are very strong contenders for um, the corporate challenge today, which is taking place up in San Francisco. So I know a number of your colleagues are up there today. And also, I see a couple people, it looks like they at least have either gone for a run or are going for a run afterward. Are you going for a run after? Oh, see, I was having a good day. Now they made me really jealous. Eh? <laughs> I won't be running with them. Um, but uh, again, thanks. It's great to be back. Uh, fantastic company. And I will say that uh, when I ran, I recently ran from uh, Los Angeles to New York City earlier this year. So I ran 3,000 miles uh, across the country. Um, in 75 days, and I ran between uh, 40 and 50 miles a day. Uh, one day I couldn't sleep, so I ran about 75 miles. Um, but you know, one of the most uh, bizarre elements of this run across the country is I had um, uh, live tracking going with Google the whole time, and so people could pinpoint my whereabouts anywhere as I was running across the country. And you know, I would find myself kind of you know, doing what runners do in a bush, you know, when you've been drinking a lot of liquid, and you know, some guy would come up behind me, hey, there you are, can I have your, you know, can I have your autograph? <laughs> so it's kind of a bizarre, bizarre occasion. Um, but anyway, as you heard during the introduction, I'm uh, both uh, a runner and a writer. And as you know, both of these are, are solo pursuits. So I've never, I've never felt comfortable in front of um, groups of, of people, you know, in front of audiences. So if I seem uh, a bit nervous, um, it, it's genuine. And you can imagine how nervous I was one day when I got a call from the folks at the David Letterman show, asking if I would be on Late Night with David Letterman. Uh, now, to me, the thought of appearing uh, on stage with David Letterman was about the most harrowing thing I could ever imagine. Um, but you know, I had two weeks before I was due to, to be on the show, and I figured 
In that time, you're going to get extensive training. There'll be media briefings. They'll let you know the, the questions David will be asking you in advance, and they'll help me prepare my answers. So I figured in that two-week period, I could get adept to being on stage with, uh, with David Letterman. Well, um, uh, you're not going to play it yet, are you? Not quite. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you know, I, I've got two weeks to be trained, briefed, prepared to be on stage with David Letterman. And I live here in San Francisco, so a week goes by, and no one has contacted me from the Letterman show. Uh, two weeks go by, and the next thing I know, I'm on a plane bound for New York City, where his studio is, and they pick me up at the, uh, at the airport, and they kind of whisk me around Manhattan in this you know, semi-sleep-deprived, jet-lagged state. And at 5.30 at night, they bring me to the back door of the Letterman studio, and they usher me up to this thing they were calling uh, the Green Room, and it was this beige room. I'm like, green, go figure. And they tell me, you know, sit down, Dean. You know, have a seat on the couch. There's food, eat, relax. Now I'm in this, you know, this green room, and I'm not very relaxed. I'm kind of thinking, you know, the training, the briefings, you know, the dry run. When are we going to get to all that stuff? We're kind of cutting it tight. And then two of David's handlers come in. And these folks sit down with me, and they say, OK, Dean, here's what you got to do tonight. When you're on the show, don't make any reference to it being Monday night, because your segment will air on Wednesday night. So I'm like, oh, OK. Yeah, I'm just a you know, runner, but I can, <laughs> I can do that. That's easy, you know, kind of and, you know, and. They kind of say, and that'll about do it. And they walk out. <laughs> so now I'm, I'm freaking a little bit. I'm looking at my watch. I'm going, the training, the briefings, the dry run. I mean, when's all this going to happen? And then two more folks walk in. And, and these people, they asked me to stand up. So I'm thinking, finally, we're going to get down to business. So I kind of stand up and you know, do what any runner would do. I start kind of shaking my limbs loose, ready for this quick training. And they kind of look me up and down. And they scratch their chins. They say, yeah, yeah, he looks fine to me. And they walk out. <laughs> they didn't even introduce themselves. I, I think they're wardrobe people. I don't even know. And so now I'm in there, and I am flipping out. Like the training, the briefings, I mean, when are we going to get down to business here? And I hear on the loudspeaker, ultra marathon man, we need you at stage level immediately. And the door opens, and there's a guy standing there. He says, follow me. So we kind of walk down this stark white hallway, and we get in this nondescript freight elevator. And we go down a couple stories, and the, first, the door opens. The first guy hands me to a second guy. The second guy kind of walks me around a corner, hands me to a third guy. And when I see this third guy, I notice he's got a headset on. And when he sees me, he says, Three, two, one, you're on. I'm like, what? He's like, go, everyone's waiting for you. <laughs> so I kind of just stammer out. I'm not sure what to expect. And I walk around this corner and wham, I'm just blinded by these huge white stage lights. I can't see anything but this sea of white. And I hear laughter and applause and people yelling my name. It was like I just walked into heaven. And I'm kind of standing there like, you know, the proverbial deer in the headlights. And I kind of look over to my left. And there with his hand outstretched was David Letterman. So what you're about to watch is what transpired. Thank you very much. Our next guest holds the record for the longest uninterrupted run in history, 262 miles. And this is his new memoir entitled Ultra Marathon Man. Please say hello to Dean Carnassus, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you here. Where are you from, Dean? I'm from San Francisco. And how did this begin, your interest in a really, really, really long running? It started uh, when I was in kindergarten, actually. It started running home from uh, kindergarten. I felt sorry for my mom. We had a third child. So I said, Mom, you don't need to pick me up. I'll, uh, I'll start running. Wow. And so is, is, there some, is, there something, from there. is there something about you physiologically that uh, makes you a good runner? Or, I mean, are you a good machine for I'm, this I'm activity? not real bright. Is the, what do you, <laughs> uh, you know, I've, I've been told I've got good biomechanics, that mm -hmm. my alignment is good. Uh, I don't pronate or supinate. Right. And I, I just believe in that. And what, what is your resting pulse? Uh, it's about 40. Well, that's remarkable, isn't it? That's pretty good, because I think the average resting pulse is like 70 something. I think it's, yeah. 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 And, and when, you, when you're at your maximum stress, what is your uh, pulse then? It goes up to 180, 185. Whoa, my. So that's extremely high as well, isn't it? Yeah, that's 
On the high end, yeah, that's when I'm really pushing. Yeah, and, and so when you're running uh, like 262 miles, what is your time per mile in an event like that? Is, is it pretty impressive? or is you... It varies. Uh, if I'm running up a hill, uh, it can be 18, 19 minute miles. Mm -hmm. uh, when I, last time I ran uh, 262 miles, the last mile I ran in uh, sub six minutes. It was flat and I, oh my God. I wanted to get Wait to the finish line. I didn't want to get the thing over with. You, you had run 261 miles and your last mile was under six minutes. Yeah, I saw the finish line, I thought, I'm over this, and so I sprinted. Wow. <laughs> and, and you've also run some, uh, in addition to the ultra marathons, you've run the traditional uh, marathon. I, I'm too slow to run a marathon. It's like a sprint. I'm too slow for that kind of stuff. R is that true? <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, I'm a uh, competitive two and a half, you know, hour marathoner, but that's about it. I couldn't muscle anything quicker than that. So nice. I'm not real fast. I can just go for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and, and, uh... <laughs> When, when you're running uh, like 260, how, how, how long did it take you to run 262 miles? I ran for 75 hours. 75 hours. Right. And, and how, how many days is 75 hours? <laughs> it's without sleep, just ran. Without yeah. sleep. Yeah. Now, do you find yourself able to doze, like I mentioned to you, as you're running a little bit or not at all? Uh, that's a problem, yes. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> on this run, I woke up one time in the middle of the road, and I, I didn't really understand, you know, I couldn't understand what happened. Then, uh, it happened again. I realized I was sleep running. I was falling asleep and I just kept running. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and are there, are there other people who, who do this? I mean, I would guess it's a small group of folks who are interested in this. <laughs> well, you know, there, there are organized 100-mile uh, runs, and there's one that's 135 miles long. But uh, this 200-mile run is a relay race, a 12-person relay race. It's not a single-person race. Mm -hmm. And I just asked if I could do it by myself as, right. a, as one person. <laughs> So, so you competed against other actual teams, but as your own team by yourself. Yeah. Wow. And, and how did you do with that? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to belittle the other teams, but I, I beat a couple of them. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well. What, what is it about this that you enjoy? Uh, the, the pain. I mean, I like pain. I really? And, and what about eating during a, a race 200 miles long? I usually carry a cell phone and a credit card, and uh, I stop along the way, and if I'm in a remote area, I'll, you know, I've ordered pizza before, I just haven't delivered to me. <laughs> <laughs> they bring it to you out on the road. As you're out on the race route, they will yeah. bring you a pizza. You tell them where you're going to be in about the approximate time, and uh -huh. they'll deliver pizza. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Is, is pizza good when you're running that distance? Is it, is it good for the body? Is it good fuel? Calories are good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Pizza, cheesecake is especially good. Cheesecake. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you get a hold of cheesecake when you're out running? I usually order dessert with the pizza. I see. <laughs> I see. <laughs> uh, what was the, the run through uh, Death Valley like? That must have been unbelievably grueling. The temperature yep. was 130 degrees it in the summer? It got up to 130. Uh, at one point, my crew, I had a crew vehicle. They handed a peanut butter and jelly sandwich out the window. They kind of handed little crumbs out. And I took it, and I was trying to get enough moisture in my mouth to actually take a bite. And when I bit into it, it was toasted. And I thought, toasted. <laughs> Who, why would they bring a toaster to yeah. Death Valley? And I realized it was, bread was toasting. It was that hot. Really? The, yeah. the ambient air was so warm, the bread actually the bread toasted? toasting, yeah. Oh, my God. Uh, and and the, the asphalt, of course, melting at 130 degrees. Your shoes would melt if you weren't careful, right? You, well, you run on the white line, and mm -hmm. I learned that the hard way. My first pair of shoes, the soles melted off, and I replaced them and then mm -hmm. stayed on the white line. And it, w was that your most physically challenging uh, event so far? I think the 262-mile uh, was a little more challenging just mm -hmm. because that third night without sleep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> A little psychotic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two, you know, two nights without sleep. So yeah, and and, and the, the, the goal now, I guess, is three hundred to run three hundred continual continual miles. I'm going to try three hundred. Uh -huh. Yeah. And and uh, are, are, are you questioning my intelligence? Well, no. <laughs> I think that was established earlier. <laughs> but, but no, um, the, the three hundred miles is that? Are you capable of doing that? 
I, I will see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. That's part of the challenge. I, I think I can, but you never know. Yeah, and, and when you're running a 300 mile, I mean, where can you have a race that's 300 miles long? I mean, here in the city, they shut down the city for the day. <laughs> But a 300 mile event, you know, you can't close up shop for like four or five days while guys stumble around. I mean, where, <laughs> where, where do you go on a 300 mile run? Well, I'll use that same, uh, the relay, the Saturn relay, I'll use that 199 mile course. I'll just run 101 miles to the start of it by myself and then run the, the relay course. And it's all on the road in the Bay Area. So wait a minute, before the race begins, <laughs> you, you actually run, and uh, how, how far do you run to get to the race? Uh, I run 101 miles to the start of the race, and then... <laughs> <laughs> all right. Does your, does your family run at all? Uh, my kids run. Mm -hmm. My wife runs if I'm chasing her. <laughs> She's not a big runner. <laughs> Uh, well, it's interesting. <laughs> and uh, good, good luck, and uh, we'll see you again. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dean Karen Nassis. He's going to run now. There he goes. We'll be right back, everybody. So I guess, you know, after the segment had aired, I was supposed to just sit there in that chair. Um, but I have this motto, when all else fails, start running. <laughs> so I got up and I just started bolting out of there as quickly as I could. And it was funny, the executive director had come down to stage level and she starts hugging me and I'm thinking, what's going on here? I mean, were they aff so afraid I was going to screw up Royal? And I kind of just, you know, held my own and kind of eked it out. And she said, no, no, that was the best segment ever. You left him speechless. He didn't know what to say. <laughs> And I apologize. I said, I didn't mean to. I mean, no one you know, trained me or anything. They said, no, no, we love it when that happens. Those are the best segments ever. We're going to get great ratings tonight. You got to come back on the show. I'm like, uh, let me get back to you on that one. So they keep calling me. And one of these days, I'm going to work up the nerve to go back on the Letterman show. But um, to date, I, <laughs> I haven't taken them up quite, uh, on it quite yet. Um, but, you know, I, I think I sh before I proceed, I think I should digress just, just a bit and um, define what an ultramarathon actually is. Uh, my son, Nicholas, came to me recently. He said, you know, Dad, I hear all this talk of ultra this, ultra that. You know, what does ultra actually mean? Now, I know maybe a handful of words in Latin, uh, but ultra is one of the words I know. And I thought, here's a prime opportunity, you know, for, for dad to impress this little guy with my vast linguistic mastery. So I said to him very high mindedly, I said, Nicholas, in Latin, ultra means beyond. He's like, oh, um, beyond what, daddy? I said, you know, beyond that which is normal. He's like, oh, I, I thought crazy was kind of that which is beyond normal. <laughs> And I said, oh, that's enough Latin for today, Nicholas. But um, basically, an ultra marathon is anything beyond a marathon. So how many of you in here have run a marathon? A lot of you. So you know it's 26.2 miles, right? Uh, an ultra marathon might be 50 miles, 100 miles, 200 miles, or even further than that. Um, ultra marathoners really stretch the boundaries of human endurance and, and human spirit. And when people learn that I've run these sort of distances, they want to know what drives me to do it. Well, I'll tell you, when people ask me what drives me to do it, you know, what I don't tell them is that it's the supreme challenge of attempting to do something that I once would have thought was entirely impossible for a human to do. Uh, when people ask me what drives me to do these things, you know, what I don't tell them is that it's a deep curiosity I have to see how far the human body can go to really test and expand the limits of human endurance. Um, when people ask me what drives me to do these things, what I don't tell them is, you know, it's, it's my way of being the best that I can be, of expressing myself. Uh, I tell these people the honest to goodness truth. I mean, I run these 100 mile and greater foot races because of all the free food I get at the aid stations. <laughs> Same reason you run the marathons, right? The half marathons. There's energy bars and there's fruit that people cut and they present it to you all nice and, and you get the free race t-shirt, right? And that's key for me, because uh, along with my son, I've got a young daughter at home, and I think our, our clothing budget exceeds the national debt. So I figured, you know, I'll just run 100 miles, get some free t-shirts, save something on clothing, right? Yeah? No, it backfired. She won't touch these things. She says they don't smell good. I tell her, Alexandria, half of them have never even been put on. She's like, Dad, they still don't smell good. And she says, besides, I can't wear the shirt that says ultra marathon, because I didn't run the ultra marathon. I'm smarter than that, Dad. 
We have cars these days. <laughs> she's like my wife. She only runs if she's being chased by wasps. Um, but you know, in reality, I mean, people hear about uh, ultra marathoning. They do have a couple questions, and the questions are typically, you know, how do you do it? Why do you do it? And what do you eat? So let me see if I can take a stab at, at answering those three questions. Uh, the first one's really easy to answer. How do you do it? And the reason it's easy to answer is because I can demonstrate right here how you do it. OK, you ready? Watch closely. Here's what you do. You kind of lean your upper torso forward, and then you begin gesticulating your arms, and you put one foot in front of the other, and you kind of go like this. <laughs> I'm doing it. <laughs> It's just running. You guys all know how to do it. I mean, and that's exactly what you do. You just run. Uh, the only difference in running two miles versus 200 miles, it just takes 40 to 50 hours longer. <laughs> but it's pretty much the same motion. Um, you know, and uh, do I have any sort of gifts that help me do these things? Well, they, they do say that um, one of the best things you can do as a long distance runner is choose your parents well. <laughs> so, you know, a couple of things that I have that, that work in my favor. Um, I have pretty good biomechanics, um, so my alignment is really good, and that means when I run, I don't uh, pronate or supinate. I've always been what's called a, a midfoot striker, so there's kind of this trend now in, in running, kind of barefoot running, minimalist footwear, which um, encourages you to strike midfoot on your stride uh, with shorter, smaller steps with a kind of a, a um, cant to your body that's slightly forward. Uh, what they found that people who strike midfoot are less prone to injuries, um, but what they do is they've done analysis of people on a soft surface, like on a soft treadmill, and found that most people running barefoot on a soft surface will inherently strike midfoot. But then when you put them in a, a big padded shoe with a big EVA slab under their heel, they'll go to this heel-toe roll. And it's that heel strike to the rolling motion that causes a lot of running-related injuries. I've never had that. I've always um, had a natural gait and had naturally good alignment. I'm 100% Greek, and my dad and sis were from the same village as, as Pheidippides, you know, the original Greek marathoner. And I always tell him, Dad, we grew up in L.A. I mean, what village? <laughs> I'm third generation. Um, you know, the other thing that uh, scientists have found with me, they've, they've analyzed me quite a bit. And uh, I've had all kinds of blood analysis done, um, VO2 max, all that kind of stuff. And I was recently um, uh, interviewed on a show by um, a guy named Stan Lee. Does anyone know Stan Lee, the comic strip guy? Yeah, who did a show called Superhumans. So I want to show you a segment of, of what they found. My name is Daniel Browning Smith, and I'm a superhuman. Comic book legend Stan Lee has sent me on a mission to find other superhumans. My search has brought me to California to meet ultra-marathon man Dean Carnassus, an endurance athlete who appears to be able to run for forever. Sport, sport, sports scientist Joseph Smith and I have already witnessed him complete a coin 12 hours. I've, I've never witnessed anything like this before. It seems like he can just go for forever. But, but, we, but whether, whether or not he actually has a superhuman ability is still a mystery. Now at, now at the University of California, San Francisco, Joseph and Dr. Zinta Zarens are putting Dean through a series of high-performance fitness tests. So we're going to be working Dean about an 8 miles per hour pace. The doctors want to find out if Dean really could run forever. This guy's a raw specimen. RAR 1.15, this is amazing. RAR 163. only hold that a couple minutes and then they stop. And, and if so, the secret behind his incredible endurance. As a side flip, we can really see a transition of, of his, his heel strike and running mechanics. So we can see that he's very solid and very strong there, which probably allows, allows Dean to run for very long distances. So far, the tests show Dean's fitness levels match those of Olympic runners. And then the biomechanics of his body confirm he was built to run. However, there's nothing to suggest Dean is superhuman. Good there. Okay, so let me get a, a I'm going to take a baseline of your. Uh, Blood lactate level as well, okay, Dean? Sure, sure. In search of answers, the doctors decide to perform a lactate analysis test. How are you feeling right now, Dean? Uh, six. Six, yeah. The test will measure the buildup of lactic acid in Dean's blood as Joseph and Dr. Zarens deliberately increase the levels of physical exertion. 
Are you going to jump off there, Dean? Yep. Okay. Lactic acid is a byproduct of our muscles burning fuel and energy from the body. How are you feeling now, Dean? Uh, I would say about eight. As the levels of lactic acid increase, the more fatigued our muscles become. How are you feeling now, Dean? Uh, I would say I've gone up to about 10 this time. Okay. They tire, begin to cramp, and ultimately render the human body incapable of taking another step. How are you feeling now? Uh, maybe 12, uh, maybe 13, maybe 12. Okay. 12. 12? Yeah. But as the test continues, the doctors notice something unexpected. His lactate levels are not rising very much, which is very unusual, evil, even though we're increasing the intensity. And, thing, and things soon become even more, more extraordinary. This is absolutely amazing, because his lactate levels are not rising. Usually you would see an inflection and a rise as we increase the exercise intensity, but he's actually clearing that la lactate. Ama amazingly, despite the increase in exercise, it seems the levels of lactic acid in Dean's blood are not rising. He's been running, running now for 24 minutes, and we've been getting, getting a, a blood lactate data point every three, three minutes. And, and in the last two readings are actually going down. This is extremely unusual and, and goes against everything we understand about human biology. 2.1. 2.1. 2.1. So did it just drop? Just drop again. Just drop again. Joe, how are we going to get this guy's threshold? He's, he's clearing that lactate. We're trying to wait for an inflection. At this pace and intensity, most people are up higher, higher than four. This is a, this is a totally superhuman yeah. experience we're having right here. Really, he could run forever because you know, there's nothing stopping him. His, his lactate levels are now lower him. than they were in the very, very beginning of his exercise. Yeah. It's amazing. Incredibly, it seems we've uncovered the unique physical power that allows us Dean to just keep on going. It's extraordinary ability to reduce the level of lactic acid in his blood defies human biology and shows he could really run forever. Have you ever seen results like this before? No, no. Not ever? Have you? No. <laughs> I don't know if that should make no. me feel good or bad. <laughs> amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. The physical and mental limits that would stop the average person from being able to run for hours on end don't, don't seem to exist for Dean. He, he, just, he just keeps on going. His, his endurance is remarkable. That guy, I think, is 82 years old. That was Stan Lee. I think his endurance is remarkable, more than mine. Um, but that was a pretty interesting finding. I don't know how many of you know what lactic acid is, but if you've ever worked out and you've kind of maybe been doing reps of a, with a weight and you start feeling that burn in your muscle, um, that's the accumulation of lactic acid. And everyone develops lactic acid, but some people apparently have an ability to, to buffer it and get it out of your system more effectively and efficiently than others. And they, you know, after finally after two hours of, of that experiment, they just said, we're not, you know, we've never, we can't get you to basically peak out to a level that uh, is going to stop you from running. So we might as well do something else. <laughs> I said, yeah, I'll go for a run. How's that? <laughs> uh, you know, the next question I get, and I'm sure a lot of runners in here get the same question, you know, why do you do it? And, you know, I can't necessarily say I understand why I do it. I mean, we humans don't always act rationally, do we? Uh, we do things like bungee jump. We, uh, we swim with sharks. We run with bulls. Um, these are not rational acts. They pretty much violate the principles of self-preservation. Uh, but we still do it, right? We're drawn to it. We're captivated. We're enthralled by it. It makes us feel alive. Um, let me share a story with you about the first guy that ever climbed Mount Everest without the use of supplemental oxygen. Uh, his name was Reinhold Meschner. And some of you know Reinhold Meschner. Uh, before he went up there and did it, nobody thought it would be possible to scale the world's highest peak without the use of supplemental oxygen, that you would you'd suffocate and you would die before you reached the summit. Well, Reinhold Meschner went up there and he did it anyway. And when he came back down, uh, a reporter interviewed him and said, why did you go up there to die? And he said, I didn't go up there to die. I went up there to live. Yeah, so we humans don't always act rationally, do we? Um, look at some of the, the irrational acts we pull when we fall in love. Yeah. I mean, does it make a lick of sense? I spend, you know, half my life's earnings on this small cylindrical object my wife places around one finger. Is that rational behavior? All the women in here are like, yeah, it makes total sense. Are you kidding? Uh, but the truth of the matter is, you know, we don't always understand our motives, and I think that's largely the, the spice of life. 
Um, other people have said to me, well, Dean, we, we get your personality. I mean, it's, it's danger. You live for the fear and the danger in this whole thing. And I, I won't deny there's a, you know, an element of danger in doing what I do. I mean, when you run for hundreds of miles you know, through the deserts and out in the wilderness, um, you're bound to have encounters. Um, I have uh, one time did a race called the Badwater Ultra Marathon. And the Badwater Ultra Marathon is a 135-mile continuous foot race that goes from a place called Badwater, which is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, and it finishes on the side of Mount Whitney, which is the highest point in the lower 48 states. So the concept is going from lowest to highest. Um, of course, there's Death Valley right in the middle of this whole thing, so you've got to run across Death Valley. And they hold this event in July, huh. when it's kind of warm out there in Death Valley. So I'll never forget, I've been running down this road for about 18 hours. And this road, it was like, remember the old Roadrunner uh, television show, the cartoon, where there's just this two-lane highway that just goes forever through the desert? That's what this road was like. And I'd run all day, and now it was night. And I'll never forget, I passed by a little town uh, called Furnace Creek. And when I say town, there's six people that live there. So pass through Furnace Creek at 2 in the morning, the low temperature that night was 116. But it's a dry heat, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I'm out there running. I haven't seen anyone for a couple hours. I haven't seen another runner. I haven't seen my crew. I haven't seen anyone. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I see this old minor 49er crossing the highway coming across to me. He's got, you know, he's got overalls on. He's got this big gray beard. And he's, he's got a gold pan in his hand. And he's walking over to me, and he looks at me, and he says, water, water. And I thought, oh my god. I, you know, and I was carrying a handheld water bottle. So I started to aspirate my water bottle in his gold pan. And I heard the water sizzling on the asphalt. And I thought, that was, that's a hallucination. Yeah. And it just got better and better. I saw dinosaurs then off in the desert, running across the desert. I'm like, and then the next thing I know, I wake up in, in a hotel room somewhere, in this air-conditioned hotel room, in a bed, kind of looking up, and I see my crew there, and I said, where, where am I? And they said, well, you're, you're in this place called Lone Pine. You're in a hotel room. And I said, well, but what do you mean? I mean, w did I finish? We're, you know, the, uh, what's, uh, what's up? I mean, was I done? Uh, I don't think I finished. And they said, <laughs> Dean, you, you finished, believe us. You were very done when we found you on the roadside, passed out. So I passed out uh, shortly thereafter, and they basically picked me up, uh, put me in this car, and drove me to safety. Um, you know, have I had encounters with animals out there? Well, yeah, I mean, there's this race called the Western States 100 Mile Endurance Run. Does anyone, some people know that race. Yeah, it's a 100 mile foot race that starts at Squaw Valley and, and finishes outside of Sacramento. And I was coming around the corner one year uh, at mile 75 on this trail, and I saw this flash of brown and, and this dust cloud, and I thought, there's a horse that's gone lame in the trail. And I kind of approached this dust cloud, and out from it stuck this massive brown bear. I was face to face with the brown bear. And you know, thankfully, I scared it worse than it scared me. And it just went bolting off down the embankment. I think I smelled so bad after running for 75 miles, it kind of scared him off. Uh, but I'll tell you, the most terrifying experience I ever had was right here in Northern California. Now, I live up in uh, San Francisco, and I love to run in Marin, in West Marin, you know, the backcountry roads out there, because I like to run through the middle of the night. And I like Marin and the backcountry roads because there's not a lot of car traffic out there. So I learned something, though. At about 2.15 in the morning, you really got to keep your eyes out, open out there, because uh, the bars let out at 2 o'clock. Yeah, and people are using these backcountry routes because they don't want to use the main thoroughfares because they've been doing something they shouldn't be doing. They're driving uh, an automobile. So I'm out there running along, minding my own business. It's about 2.15 in the morning, and this car comes whizzing around the corner, heading right for me. Now, it's not that unusual. I mean, who's expecting to come around a corner in the middle of nowhere and find a guy out there running, right? But I'm pretty lit up. You know, I've got this reflective vest on. I've got a flashing red blinker. I've got a headlamp on. I'm carrying a handheld flashlight. I'm pretty much like a running Christmas tree, you know? <laughs> well, this car does not divert. I mean, they keep coming right for me. And when that happens, what I usually do is I take my handheld flashlight and I kind of shine it in their windshield just to alert them, you know, hey, there's a guy out here running. So I kind of shine it in their windshield and, and they still don't divert course. And now they're coming right for me and I'm thinking this would be a good time 
to bail off the roadside. So I turn to jump off the road and there's a solid embankment. I mean, I, there's nowhere to go. And all of a sudden I'm finding myself head faking this two ton mass of steel that's coming at me and it's all happening really quickly. And whoosh, this car goes by so close, I literally felt the heat of their radiator on my thigh. I mean, it was that close. And I just stood there thankful to be alive and then I got, a little, I got a little mad, I got a little pissed off. I thought, you know, they had to have seen me. They, they were toying with me, and that wasn't right. So, you know, I held up a fist, tough guy that I am. It was decent, there was no digits extended. I mean, it was good. <laughs> and they hit the brakes. I thought, uh-oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. And then they threw it in reverse. And I thought, this is it. I've met my destiny right here on this lonely roadside in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Well, this car comes screeching to a halt right next to me, and this manic woman, she jumps out of the driver's seat, she runs around the front of the car, she whips open the passenger side door, and she starts rifling through this bag that's on the seat. And I'm just standing there paralyzed in fear thinking, you know, is it a knife? Is it a gun? I mean, how is the end going to come? She reaches in and she pulls out a copy of my book. <laughs> <laughs> and she looks at the cover and she looks at me and she's like, oh my God, you're that crazy runner guy. Oh, I, what a coincidence. My boyfriend loves you. I just bought him a copy of your book. You got to sign it. <laughs> and she puts a pen in my hand and I'm sitting there just kind of trembling like I didn't know what to do and she said oh, oh his name is Bob say something inspirational and I felt like writing Bob your girlfriend's a psycho <laughs> get out while you can bro <laughs> so I, I signed Bob's book and she takes it and she's like oh you don't know how happy this will make him thank you thank you and she throws it back in Slams the door, runs around, gets in, and just drives off into the night. So yeah, I've had some terrifying experiences out there. Believe me, I live for the fear. You know, and the final question I get, and I'm sure a lot of you runners get this question as well, what do you eat? And, you know, when I'm out on these long runs, I pretty much follow a, a seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. <laughs> um, you know, that's the kind of the tongue-in-cheek answer. I mean, um, the long answer is that you saw on the Letterman clip, I always run with a backpack and I carry in it a, uh, a cell phone and a credit card. And if I find my, myself in a remote area, I, I've been known to order pizza. <laughs> Seems logical, right? And I've learned some important life lessons from this experience, and I'll share those with you. Uh, Hawaiian style. The pepperoni's too spicy, it doesn't sit well when you're running. So you order the Hawaiian style pizza, um, you request they don't slice it, and you get the thin crust. And then when they deliver it, what you do is you roll this thing into this big Italian burrito. And then you just mow as you run. <laughs> oh, and it's just gruesome. It gets all over you. <laughs> but it's so good. <laughs> it's really good fuel. <sighs> and, um, you know, what else do I eat? Well, uh, one time during a, one of the 200-mile relay runs that I ran, I had my crew actually keep track uh, of all the food um, that I consumed over the course of 200 miles. So uh, everything I, I ate or drank, they kept a log. And it took me uh, 45 hours and 16 minutes to run these 200 miles. And in that time frame, I consumed 28,000 calories. Yeah, so for those of you doing the math, that's about uh, two weeks worth of food in just under two days of nonstop uh, running. But I think probably the most interesting side note is in that same period, I burned about 34,000 calories. So even though I ate all this food, I still lost four pounds at the end of this 200 mile run. And my next uh, book is gonna be a diet book. <laughs> you know, the ultra marathon diet, you just start running, you can mow whatever you want, right? <laughs> Oprah's gonna love it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think I'll just uh, conclude with um, maybe a couple quick stories from the, the run across America. So. Uh, like I said, it was 3,000 miles, it was 40 to 50 miles a day, and I met some incredible people out there and had some um, remarkable experiences. Um, I'll share a couple of them. Um, one thing I'll never forget is running through the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. 
Uh, it was a really hot, humid day. I'll, I won't forget, it was about maybe 90 degrees and about 90% humidity. And I'm out there running along, and we are in um, Hicksville. I mean, we are in the countryside of the Ozarks in moonshine country kind of thing. Well, I've got to go to the bathroom. And I tell my crew, guys, I really got to go. And they said, well, you know, just pop over the bush and do your thing. You've done it 100 times during this run. I'm like, no, no, I, I got to go big potty. <laughs> and so they said, well, here's some toilet paper. You know, be discreet. Just, you know, go down one of these driveways or something. So I kind of go down this driveway, and I'm kind of, you know, parked on the side, doing my thing, taking care of business. And I look up, and there's a sign across the way, and it says, prayer is the best way to meet God. Trespassing on my property is a faster way. <laughs> And I hear this car coming. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> so that was a, a quick job, we'll say. <laughs> and then another story, which was so uh, juxtaposed, is I, I was running through Ohio, just on this rural country road in Ohio. And it was just a bucolic setting. And there's this, this house with this beautiful white picket fence and this porch. And there's a, an old lady in a rocking chair on the porch of this house. And I'm running by. And she looks at me. She goes, oh, there you are. I've been waiting for you all day. Like, oh, that's so sweet. And she says, come on up here, Sonny. I'm thinking, this lady's so, I, I can go up a couple stairs and say hi to her. So I kind of walk up her stairway. And she says, come on down, put your cheek right next to mine. And I'm thinking, this sweet old lady, she wants to touch cheeks or something. So I kind of put my cheek next to her. She whips out an iPhone. She holds it up. She goes, smile. <laughs> she snaps a photo. She goes, oh, my friends are going to be so jealous when I put this on my Facebook page. The only thing I thought about telling her since I'm here, I should say, well, you should put it on Google Plus, actually. <laughs> um, and I'll, I'll conclude with just a, a quote from, from my book. And I know you guys all have a, or you know, some of you got a copy of the book. Um, the, I don't know the origins of this quote. I, I did a lot of research on Google. I couldn't find the origins of this quote. And I've seen it used in a couple other sources uh, since this book went to press. And it was passed along to me from a, another ultra marathoner. But I still really like the quote. And it goes like this. Um, Life is not a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a pretty and well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. So as you move along this road we call life, uh, may the wind always be at your back. Uh, may a smile perpetually grace your face. And most of all, may you all enjoy the ride. So good luck to you all. Thanks for having me. You guys got a, we have a few minutes for our questions. Um, if you guys would actually please like form a line and use the microphone here so we all can hear what your questions are and so the dean can actually answer you. If you guys have any questions. I have a quick one. Did you run here? <laughs> that was a, that's a good question. I was saying uh, I just flew in from the East Coast, from Chicago actually, or I would have run here. And we're going to, I'm coming back, right, in November. So I'm going to do a, a, a fun run in November. And I'm going to run down and then probably run back home. So you want to join me? <laughs> it's, I think it's like uh, 42, 42 miles down, and then what do we do, a 5K fun run, or, and then 42 back. So bring pizza. You're in. <laughs> Go ahead. A any injuries? Like, when was your last injury? And uh, I think I should um, knock on wood. <laughs> I've um, never had an injury. I shouldn't say that because I'm going to walk outside and like trip off the curb and break my leg. But yeah, no, I've, I've been very fortunate. Even in the run across America, I'm, the worst I suffered, I lost a couple toenails. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your nice talk. Can you hear me? Does I can work? hear you, yeah. yeah. Can you guys hear okay? I think it's yeah. for the, yeah, it's for the people. I have, uh, two quick questions. The first one is when, when I, uh, me and my husband go hiking, we get headaches often. I wonder. I, I don't know if it's dehydrated, dehydrated or something. I wonder whether you get headaches when you run. And the second question is, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have a home birth, and I'm going to deal with pain. I, w I wonder how do you deal with pain? Okay. Those are two good questions. Um, the, the first one, I, I need some clarification, though. When you get headaches, are you at altitude, or are you just at sea, or sea level when you get the headaches? Uh, hills. Wait. Hills? Yeah. Uh, how, do you know how high the hills go? Do the elevation they go 5,000 feet or Maybe just? The Wild Canyon. Oh, here, yeah, here. Um, are you hot? Are you overheated? Yeah, hot. And I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
maybe it's a hydration thing. Uh, I know if you're dehydrated, that can lead to headaches. So maybe drink more liquid and more electrolytes. Do you sometimes get headaches too when you run? No, not really. No, I, I, when I'm running at altitude, like up in the mountains in Colorado, yes, but not, not around here, yeah. Okay. Um, and, you know, the second question about pain and how I deal with pain, you know, I think that brings up a really interesting topic, and that is um, how women excel in endurance sports. And there's, it's not unusual for a woman to win outright an ultra marathon. And I'm not talking about, you know, playing from the women's tees or anything like that. I'm talking about no handicap, everyone on the same starting line, the woman will win the ultra marathon. And there's a couple of um, things that scientists propose. You know, one is that um, women have more body fat, so they have a, a greater source of energy to, to metabolize in longer runs. Um, the second thing is that because women um, go through childbirth and estrogen, they have a higher pain tolerance. So perhaps women have a higher pain tolerance. I know that uh, my, my wife had a natural birth and she was in kind of the same place I get to when I run for hundreds of miles. I mean, she was that out of it. I'd never seen her like that, but she didn't say it was painful. She said it was more like blissful. I thought, boy, running 200 miles, there's nothing blissful about that. <laughs> yeah. So if during birth I ever think about, I want to give up. So, so when, when, when you run, whenever you think you want to give up, what do you do? What? You know, that's, that's a really good question. And I do something I just call take baby steps. So I think a lot of you experience this, especially during a marathon. You're, you know, you start watching the mile markers. Like you might say, I'm at mile 18 now. Where's mile 19? I'm so hurting. Um, I can't imagine getting to mile 19. And when I get there, I still have 7.2 miles to go. It's, it's demoralizing and it's incredible. I can't deal with it. And I always tell people, don't get ahead of yourself. When the pain sets in, just be present, be in the moment. Really just be there and say, my next footstep is gonna be my best, and my next one I'm gonna try my hardest, and my next footstep, every, just get that granular. And a lot of times the pain, you'll push through uh, the pain uh, or you'll black out. <laughs> Either way, it's a good adventure, you know? <laughs> Your answer is very helpful. Thank you. Okay, don't black out. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm like a lot of you. I'm from the West Coast. I, I live for outdoor sports. So I've done a lot of what they call adventure racing. So expedition length adventure racing, which is, you know, three days with the team. I've done um, Ironman. I've never done Ironman Kona. That's on my, my life list. I've never done Kona. Uh, I've done 24-hour mountain bike rides, continuous mountain bike rides. Um, I've done uh, endurance uh, stand-up paddleboard races. Uh, I did the, you know, I've swum across the, the bay a couple times. I've done some things, yeah. Hi, uh, uh, the ultra community is, uh, one of the draws of it is that it's, uh, it's not as competitive. It's kind of like a closed-knit group of people who just are out there kind of doing the thing, having fun. With all the attention that it's getting, I'm wondering if you're concerned that it's going to kind of be a victim of its own success, if it's going to start bringing in more of the competition and the, uh, you know, the drive and everybody's going to kind of whittle away at the, the, the culture. Yeah, and you know, that, for us kind of in the ultra running community, that's a really interesting question. I mean, for, for, I, I like to keep it in perspective though, like you know, for 99% of the people, they can't even relate to what we do, let alone talking about kind of the, you know, the dynamics of this very niche community potentially changing. Um, I, don't, I, I think that you know, on some levels, it's a, it's a good thing for the sport. On other levels, it, it's probably not a good thing for the sport. I mean, you know, these things are always not quite black and white. But I think that the more people that get into it, uh, I think it's helpful as far as bringing awareness. And potentially, it provides a source of income for people that want to make a living doing it. Um, the downside is, you know, yes, it, it, you know, it's, it's kind of tainted it in certain ways. It's certainly become a lot more competitive as far as the racing. I mean, you know, I say these, these guys now are running, you know, 100-mile dashes. I mean, it's incredible what they're doing over 100 miles. So the, the competition has become uh, much higher. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's necessarily um, what people do it for. I mean, I think that most people define... Uh, victory is just finishing. I mean, most people that stand, start at the Western States 100 or Badwater, all they want to do is get to the finish line. I mean, they really don't care who wins or loses. Certainly a lot of us track on that, but
but they're just in it for can I make it? And I think that's, you know, going that sort of distance is always going to have that challenge. I think there'll always be a magic in that. Yeah, okay. Hi, I was wondering uh, what sorts of technologies you wish were available to better sort of share your adventures while you're out there? And what can we do to help? Yeah, uh, you guys have done a lot to help. I mean, believe me, the technology that exists now versus even two or three years ago is just amazing. So, you know, the, the live tracking has really made things interesting. Um, so running, you know, with a, with a GPS device and having people be able to follow me and kind of just really tune into it. I think um, I can even upload some of my vitals so they can look at my heart rate real time. I mean, and they can pinpoint my whereabouts. Um, they can look at my heart rate. Uh, you know, the thing that I, I like is just finding a, a device that kind of brings everything together in a device so that you can listen to your music in a small device. You've got uh, GPS. Um, as well as a heart rate monitor that's built in. I mean, there's heart rate monitors now that are just earbuds, and they're Bluetooth, so you literally just put it in your ear, you can listen to music, it takes your heart rate, it'll give you feedback, you know, your mile markers, your pace, and it'll also, um, if you've got your cell phone on you, it'll pick up a call, and it'll announce, like, you know, your wife is on the phone, your wife is on the phone. So kind of the, the convergence of all those technologies, I think, would be in a single device is probably where things are going, but it's, I don't know if we're quite there yet. But you, thanks, Google. I mean, you've done wonders for running technology, wonders, yeah. Hi, Dean. Um, my question for you is um, I hate running. And my, my two motivators um, before I start my run is the endorphins I'm going to get after and, more importantly, the food that's waiting for me. Um, I always say when I run uh, races, if you put a donut on my partner's run, um, I'll run after him the whole way and get to the finish line. So my question for you is before you start runs that you don't really look forward to, what, where do you get your um, mental motivation to put that first step forward? That's a, that's a good question. And, you know, I, I'm not naive. Running's not for everyone. I mean, I always tell people, uh, you know, to find an activity that you love and enjoy because if you don't enjoy it, let's face it, you're not going to keep it up. And it's, it's going to be a struggle to want to do it. I love to run. So people say, you know, how do you get up and train every day? Well, when you're doing what you love, it's, it's not that hard. Uh, but there are, you know, there are many days, you know, I, I like to say uh, being motivated is, is tough, especially if you're not motivated. <laughs> there are days I just don't want to go for a run. I mean, you know, people say, listen to your body. Well, you know, my body says sit on the couch and drink a beer. <laughs> so it, sometimes it just takes that sheer discipline of, of getting out the door. Uh, I use a technique that's called, the psychologist called projection. So it's kind of like projecting how much better you will feel when you're done. As a motivator, just get out the door and just get down the street. Uh, I can't think of one single time in all my years of running where I felt worse after a run or after a workout than I did before. So it's that kind of knowing that you're going to feel better, uh, knowing that your, your attitude will, and your mindset will change um, that, that motivates me to get going. Food, sure. I mean, I always tell people, you know, when you, when you really don't feel like running, um, don't, you know, mix up your, your workout. Like, I run a different route every single day. I run sometimes in the morning, early, sometimes at night, sometimes midday. Uh, if I've really lost my motivation um, to, you know, to stay on a certain training regime, I'll just throw, a, you know, a, a, a backpack on with some money in there and, and go for, a, you know, a four to five hour walkabout. I call it a runabout. Just go wander. Uh, in a unique new place. And if you see a donut shop or, a, you know, a, you feel like a latte, grab a latte, you know, and, and just keep going. Walk if you have to, run when you can, and just kind of, you know, make it more an adventure than a chore. Don't compartmentalize your running like, oh, I got to go for my one hour run today. Make it part of your lifestyle. I mean, r run to your office, <laughs> you know, run to the post office, you know, run to get groceries, whatever. Um, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, the other thing I suggest is, how many of you have a, a stand-up desk? Yeah, so a lot of you, like, I, I don't sit ever during the day. I literally never sit. I do, I've got my whole office set up at waist level. And in between taking, you know, uh, calls, like conference calls and emails and working, I've got a, um, a sit-up pad. I do sets of sit-ups, push-ups, and I've got a pull-up bar mounted in my office. So I'm cycling through those things all day, as well as I'm just bouncing up and down on my feet all day. And you know, some people have asked, Don't you, aren't you exhausted when you've been on your feet all day? 
those of you who has a stand-up desk, you know you're, you're not. I mean, you're more, way more energized now than when you were sitting down in front of a computer. So I tell people, stand all day, uh, be on your toes. I mean, fitness is your lifestyle. You are about fitness. It's not just, you know, shift your paradigm. Like, um, I, I am all about, you know, a total a healthy, active, living lifestyle. And that's from my diet to any sort of activity I do toward every sort of activity I do. You know, 360, 24 seven, I'm about health and fitness. And once you define, you know, your, your life is like that, um, sometimes you'll define foods that just like, hey, that, a donut is just not even in my realm of possibility. I don't miss that stuff. Because now I know it's not even my realm of possi you know, it's not even on my radar as something that's even viable to eat. So when I see a donut store, I don't like crave a donut. I'm like, well, that doesn't even fall within the category of what I'll choose. Uh, and that, that's helped me a lot. Yeah. Does that help? Okay. Hi. Um, I was just curious before your, like your 100 mile runs, for example, like the night before, what do you, what do you eat to prepare? You know, um, the logic has kind of gone full circle with eating. I mean, there's this regime we, used, a lot of endurance athletes used to follow called carbo loading, where you basically just load up on carbohydrates, lots and lots of carbs, like lots of pasta. And, and inevitably, you show up at the starting line the next morning, you're just bloated. <laughs> so I don't eat anything um, that's much different than I would during a normal, um, uh, during my normal diet. I, you know, try to eat. A little less fiber, fibrous foods, so a little less bulk uh, in my gut, um, but pretty much a normal diet. And uh, even during the, the runs, I don't, you know, when I do like sprint distance races, like marathons, um, <laughs> I basically just use like, you know, gel packs, you know, goos, gels, um, so not even any solid food. But then when I do these longer runs, I do eat some, I do eat solid food and like um, some weird foods. Uh, during that Badwater Ultra Marathon, kind of my go-to food is a, um, an almond butter sandwich. So for me, almond butter sits really, really well, better than peanut butter. So I have uh, an almond butter sandwich with uh, bananas and honey, and then I put the, the bread on top, and then depending on the heat, I drizzle soy sauce on top of all that. And the soy sauce is really a, a great electrolyte um, source. So I eat those kind of solid foods as well during the longer runs. So I have two questions for you. The first one is, um, are there, what, what kind, what inspirations did you get during your runs that you, you, you would like to share with us? Um, I don't know, myself, I get some inspirations when I run, so I would imagine you would get them too. And the second question is, um, do you have any inspirations that could help in general from your running to every, to life in general, for success, you know, for whatever that means, you know, okay. success in life. Yeah. Well, as, you know, as far as um, some uh, running tips, I mean, I always tell people, if you want to start a running routine, um, start from the ground up. So go to a, a good running specialty store, like a Fleet Feet or Palo Alto Running Company, and have them fit you with a really good pair of shoes. Uh, have, being, having comfortable shoes, good shoes from a knowledgeable staff member will really help. They're going to be expensive, and, and that's, that's good, because when you're feeling guilty, you know, you feel like I should be running, and you look at these you know, $160 pair of shoes in your closet, you're like, damn, I better run. I just spent all this money on that. So I would say, you know, get some good running shoes. Um, as far as, um, you know, inspirational words, I mean, I'll, I, when I ran 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days, I'll never forget, I was running around. One of the, the, the marathon courses went around a track, an infield track at a college. And this, this group of kids had trained for weeks and weeks to run with me around this track. And I'm running around this track with this group of kids. And there's got to be a kid there. He's maybe five or six years old. And the teacher said he'd been just training very, very hard for this run. And he is giving it his all. I mean, this kid is just laying it out as we're running along. And I kind of commented on his you know, aggressive pace. And he looks up at me and says, Mr. Carnassus, I run like I mean it. <laughs> So, you know, I always thought, live life like you mean it, you know, was, yeah. And then, you know, the thing for me is I always have, um, you know, goals in mind, future goals and aspirations and kind of stretch goals or dreams, I, I more like to say. And uh, my next dream, hopefully Google will be very involved in this because it, uh, it's running a marathon in every country of the world in one year. So taking off on this uh, global expedition, um, the UN recognizes 204 countries 
and running a marathon in each of those 204 countries in the, in the spin of the globe one time. And I think that you know, having a goal like that, that involves both logistics, planning, you know, geography, culture, uh, to me that's something that just it, it, it completely engages me in every sort of way. So you know, keep, a, keep something on the horizon, whether it be a half marathon, a 10K, you know, maybe a marathon so, at some point in your future. I hope that helps. Thanks. Okay. For my actual substantive question, I have a random one. What percentage of the day are you in normal clothes? In what? Like normal street clothes. Like, are you always in running clothes and running shoes? You know, the great thing about being me, because I'm kind of like this runner guy, is I can go anywhere, no matter how formal the, the meeting, and people expect me to show up in a pair of sweats. I mean, like, when I put on normal clothes, they're like, hold it, you know, what's wrong? What, are you having a bad day or something? So I'm, I don't think I, you know, I, I know I don't own a tie anymore. I think I have one suit, but I never wear. My buddy used to run this company called uh, Seven for Mankind. Seven for All Mankind. It's like this premium jean company. I didn't even know about them. And so I've got a closet full of these you know, $200 jeans that have holes in them. And <laughs> I never even put them on. Once in a while, I do. Yeah. All the girls in the audience are like, oh, man, I wish I had that. <laughs> um, but my real question is, so I just did this race over the weekend called Tough Mudder. In squad. Right on. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, it was not a good idea, but I'm glad I finished. Well, did you finish? I did. So I just went yeah. CrossFit, but I do not run. Okay. Ever. I never run, I never hike, I never go up hills. Yeah. And so before the race, I decided to read your book as inspiration, your first book. And it was very inspiring, especially at the times when we had to jump into ice water and you get out and you have to hike up two more hours. And you just feel so bad, right? And your feet are gross and they're blistering. I was thinking about everything you went through when you were in Death Valley and it really helped. But the one thing I don't remember reading was what happens afterwards when you're extremely sore? <laughs> the aftermath. Do you not get sore? Like, uh, oh, yeah, I get sore, that? yeah. Like, what no, do you do? I, yeah. Um, you know, there's a couple things I do to try to mitigate soreness. Um, one is uh, the next day I basically carry an Nalgene bottle with me wherever I go, and I'm just drinking tons of fluid because you want to – um, get your kidneys to flush out all that kind of cellular debris and all the kind of byproducts of metabolism. So um, drink a lot. The other thing that's really hard to do is after the event, um, get in an ice bath. Oh, it, yeah, you, some of you should. Yeah, I mean, it pays huge dividends. It's the hardest thing in the world to do because you just want to get in a jacuzzi, right, and get hot and warm and comfortable. That's the wrong thing to do. You want to try to control the inflammation. So if you can get into an ice bath, um, the other thing that is really hard to do is force yourself the next day to go for a run. No way. Yeah. It, it's, it's more like a hobble. It's really more like a hobble, a, you know, just a, sh a shuffle. But if you can get your legs turning over and you get your heart rate elevated, again, it'll, just, it'll, it'll speed up the cycle of recovery. Yeah, yeah. I, jump, I jump rope this morning. I almost cried. Um, <laughs> but ice baths are good. It's good advice for next time. We went under submerged for, in four ice baths during the race. Yeah, I no, I know that, right? I mean, it's incredible, yeah. yeah. But uh, congratulations on making it. I mean, you know, the dropout Thanks. ratio for that, I mean, what is it, like 60% no, of the people no, no, don't? No, 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 I think like 80% finish. Yeah, okay, But this one well, was really tough. Yeah. But thanks for the advice. Yeah, thanks good job. No, congrats. Hey. hey. Do, am I good to do this? Do we can keep going? Okay, that's fine with me. Last We're going to go running afterward, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so you talked about your life list, the try, or the Iron Man and... Um, this 204 country project is a big one, but like, what are the other runs or challenges that you want to tackle before it's all over? Yeah, well, you know, um, people say, are you ever going to stop running? And, you know, I, I always say my, uh, my finish line is a, a pine box. <laughs> you know, if I love it, I'm going to keep going and, you know, until I'm an old man. And, you know, if one morning I wake up and I don't like to run, I'll stop running. But, you know, right now the fire still burns hot. and. Um, you know, this, this, this dream of running uh, a marathon in every country has been all-consuming. All and right now, it's just every you know, ounce of, of thought and, and spirit I have, I'm really pouring into that event because it's such a huge undertaking. And, you know, I don't, I'm not even planning beyond that. I mean, you know, who knows what will happen if I can even get to that starting line. And if I do, who knows if I'll make it. But just the idea of, of doing that event. And I think the magic of that event will be to invite um, country people to run with me um, when I'm in their country. So, you know, maybe not the whole marathon if they can't run that far, but just maybe some portion thereof. And we're gonna, it's going to be a benefit for the most important cause in that nation. So 
Um, hopefully, it'll shed some light on you know the diversity of, of issues we're facing as a, as a world. You know, it might be malaria prevention, it might be clean water. Um, some of the Western civilizations, it might be you know anti-obesity, but you know bringing in that element as well. So kind of the multi-layers of that has just got me thinking of one thing right now. Yeah, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, I'm sponsored by the North Face, and we do this event called the Endurance Challenge Series. So it's a series of, uh, yeah, 50K, there's a 50 miler, there's a marathon, some shorter distances, you know. But yeah, I do it. I do. Are you going to do the one in San Francisco? Yeah, yeah. Are you going to do the 50K? Have you done an ultra before? Nope. Are you ready to die? <laughs> okay. Do you know the core? Oh, do you live here? Yeah, so you know, so you can train. Yeah, no, it's it's a great 50k, and um, it's it's very hilly, but it's in Marin. I mean, it's really scenic. The aid along the way is great, and yeah, I'll see you there. What's your name? Armando. All right, Armando. Yeah, I'll see you out there. Yeah, I'll see you at the start too. I'm at the start and the finish. And... <laughs> Hi. It doesn't sound like you. It doesn't sound like you particularly care about PRs, but. Uh, for a, let's say a marathon, do you feel like as you get older, you're unable to beat your peers, or how are your times holding up? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that's an interesting um, observation. Is I, I you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I've never been competitive in the marathon distance. I've never even trained for a marathon, so uh, I don't know, you know, how fast I could possibly get. I doubt I could ever crack 2:30. And it, you know, and so in other words, I, I could be kind of a good marathoner, but never elite. But I mean, do you feel like you're getting slower with age? That's my question. You know what I feel? I feel like my endurance is improving and my, th my pain threshold is still improving and my strength is improving. I mean, I'm sure there'll be a point of, of diminishing returns where it'll go the other way. But right now, I feel like uh, my endurance to go further and further is improving. My speed is coming down. Uh, what I've really noticed is to you know, maintain the same pace, I just have to train a lot harder. Where you know, I used to be able to go bust a you know, 35, 36 minute 10K with, without really that much base. Now, you know, I really got to train hard to keep up that, that pace for even a, a 10K. So a lot harder to, yeah, your speed goes down as you get older. I've repressed the fact that I'm getting older. I just don't want to get older. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Thanks for coming out. And thanks for hanging around. And, you know, good luck to you.